All right. Today is Monday, April 4th, and this is a recap of the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And I know, I know you've been saying, hey, what's up with the negativity, bro? Everything is negative, dark and gloomy. How about some positive videos once in a while? Well, I got one for you tonight. Let's see if you can handle it or not. And here it is, in focus tonight. Down with the oligarchy, a major victory for organized labor in this country. Let's start by this. We got the non-farm payrolls on Friday. And in it, we continue to see wage inflation moving higher and higher and higher. And the proponents for inflation, aka the propagandists, for this administration in the media and otherwise, they continue to say, oh, but inflation is okay. The Fed doesn't need to end the party by tightening the monetary policy. Because look at wage gains, for example. Workers in this country are enjoying massive wage gains. Leisure and hospitality, retail, education, business, manufacturing, construction. Wages are up across the board. Matter of fact, it's such a hot economy, you got the opportunity to switch jobs and increase your wages higher. Job switchers are enjoying 6.6% increase in their wages. Job stayers are enjoying 5.4% increase in wages. Here's the problem. Net-net, when you factor in inflation, real wage gains in America are actually negative. We're down about three points. When you factor in the latest reading of inflation and the latest reading of wage gains in this country, we're down about 3%. Our purchasing power is down. Our standard of living is down because inflation continues to move higher all around us. Rents, utilities, food, transportation, gasoline. Just look at food inflation alone. All in all, it is up 14% year over year. Beef and veal up over 20% year over year. Grains almost 20% year over year. Dairy over 15% year over year. Fruits, melons up over 10% year over year. And all in all, we're seeing wage gains being eroded fast and quick. All of these wage gains since the thing started in the majority of retailers Inflation is eroding away all of these wage gains. So this is a massive loss for the working class in this country. Inflation serves the rich, stocks go higher, real estate values go higher, but the standard of living for the majority, for the working class specifically, goes down dramatically. We're seeing job quits across the country. In February alone, 4.4 million Americans quit their jobs. And since last November, the number is staggering. Over 13.2 million Americans quit their jobs. And this is the highest rate of quits pretty much in history. Quits are all over the place, specifically in the mountain states, southern states. People are quitting their jobs like never before. Why is this happening, by the way? You look at states like Washington, Missouri, Wyoming, Oregon, Nevada. All of these states were seeing the rate of hires dropping from 2020 all the way to 2022. On the other hand, we have jobs openings like never before. Why is this happening? Why are people quitting their jobs? Why are we seeing all of these new jobs openings struggling to be filled? Here's the answer. When U.S. workers are asked after they left the job, for example, what was the major reason? for quitting your job. 37%, the majority say that the pay was too low. Why would you work a job when you're actually losing money? When you're down 3% net net, you're better off staying at home and cashing government checks. This is what they want at the end of the day. Own nothing and be happy. More than 40% of companies say workers have asked for higher pay to offset inflation. Few have revised salary budgets, meaning corporations are not increasing salaries for workers to catch up with inflation. Is it really surprising that we have all of these job openings that are not being filled, not to me at least, when we have shitty pay? Who wants to take the job? Listen to this, for example. Just 24% of workers think their employer cares about their well-being. Your employer buying an arcade game or giving you a ping pong table and a stupid coffee machine and breaks here and there, that doesn't do shit with the quality of working in that particular company. So take your stupid ping pong table and shove it up your ass because workers care more about the pay and having a flexible schedule where they can work from home a few days a week, etc, etc. None of this is being met by employers. They don't give a shit at all because at the end of the day, it is corporate slavery. You work when you're told, how you're told, and keep your mouth shut. How could we not see a backlash by the working class in this country? 
when you have corporate profits reaching record highs, the fattest profit margins since 1950. But I know the poor corporations, if we tax them a little more or ask them to pay us a little more, God forbid that might hurt the bottom line for these companies and they stop hiring and they fire us anyways. This is the brainwashing that they've been teaching you all along since you were a baby. That you gotta handle corporations with white gloves and be as gentle as you can. Otherwise, they might not hire workers. People might lose their jobs. This is the blackmail that corporate propaganda has been playing in this economy for a long time. And it's part of the mass brainwashing of the public. That it is anti-capitalist to ask these companies to pay a fair wage. A wage that keeps up with inflation. If you ask for that, you're a communist. You're a socialist, you're anti-American, yada, yada, yada. All of that corporate-sponsored propaganda they teach you in schools and colleges. But is it really true? Because here is the reality with these poor corporations. CEO pay rose to a record 19% in 2021, while employees, nothing garbage. They got nothing. They're down 3%. CEO pay skyrocketing as the average worker struggles to keep up with inflation. Here is who got the biggest raises. Ah, uh, spoiler alert, Amazon. Several CEO salaries grew to astronomical rates in 2021. A roughly $247 million. Discovery, INC, David Zasloff had the highest salary disclosed so far, followed closely behind by Amazon's Andy Jassy at nearly $213 million. But oh, these poor corporations, they can't afford to pay workers a little more. They cannot afford to pay their taxes. Anyways, while CEO salaries rose 19% in 2021, the average hourly wage in the United States rose just 4.7% last year, according to the Department, Labor Department, excuse me. Not enough to keep with inflation that many analysts predict will remain elevated, likely worsen. In the months to come. At Discovery, Zaslav's pay is nearly 3,000 times the median salary at the company, which the company reported was 82,964 bucks in 2021. At Amazon, the wage gap is far higher. For example, Jassy's 2021 salary is roughly 6,500 times the 32,855 bucks median Amazon worker's salary. Wow. You want to talk about injustice? Here's injustice. Are you talking about it? Of course not. Because you've been brainwashed from the get-go to become a corporate apologist. Otherwise, you're not a capitalist. What, are you a socialist or something, comrade? Anyways... Here comes the hero to rebalance this injustice. His name is Christian Smalls. He was a warehouse worker at Amazon, I believe in New York, and he got fired from his job because he complained about safety conditions at the warehouse. He also disclosed a lot of virus cases within that warehouse. And for doing whistleblowing, Amazon punished him by firing him and accusing him of trespassing and not following social distancing guidelines. Here was a brief interview with Kristen Smalls in the Jimmy Dore program. Thank God I was there on Tuesday. And Tuesday's not even my scheduled shift. I start work on Wednesday. But because we're on mandatory overtime, I had to come in a day earlier. So I was just there on my overtime day and I sent her home. And I didn't even stay for my overtime day. I left at 12 o'clock. But thank God I was there. You know, they're putting it out there as if I put people's lives at risk. No, the company put people's lives at risk. I was trying to save lives. I sent her home immediately um, and I took my stance. I came back to, you know, uh, inform the employees what's really going on behind scenes. Um, every day I marched a group of people into the general manager's office um, and to voice our concern. We wanted to build in clothes and sanitize. Um, and they didn't do that. They they didn't do that. They didn't listen. You know, everything was, oh, we're on, a, we're on a call with the regionals. We're on a call with the regionals. Who the hell are these regionals? They're making the wrong decision. Like, this is your building. You're the site leader. You're the general manager. Do something about it. And they, nothing was done. So I had to take action. Um, it forced me to mobilize the, the walkout. And that's exactly what I did. So... And they retaliated by firing you for 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 getting people to walk out. Absolutely. Less than two hours. So you um, so you sit in the cafeteria Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. When do you organize the walkout? Man. I don't know why this is happening. You know, 
a week ago, my life was different. But, uh, you know, I don't know how it came together. I really don't. I still don't know what's going on here. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Jimmy. No, um, no problem, Chris. I understand it. Your life is being turned upside down. You got responsibilities. You took a stand. You stuck your chin out. You got fired. Now you got bills to pay like everybody and everybody's worried. And uh, this is exactly why we're having you on. And we're going to have on a labor leader after you to talk about how we can all come together and protect ourselves right now and protect people like you. And of course, since then, Amazon tightened the grip on its workers. They became fearful of any unionization effort. They placed surveillance on their own labor, spying on their own workers and creating a toxic working environment where the company encouraged certain workers to rat on one another. This is not a healthy working environment when you have Big Brother watching every step and everything you say. Dozens of leaked documents from Amazon's Global Security Operations Center reveal the company's reliance on Pinkerton operatives to spy on warehouse workers and the extensive monitoring of labor unions, environmental activists, and other social movements. Here's another headline. Five ways Amazon monitors its employees from AI cameras to hiring a spy agency. I wouldn't be surprised, by the way, if Amazon used Pegasus software to spy on their own workers. Do the spy know when I'm peeing on my diaper because I cannot use a restroom break at Amazon? Do they know that? Here's another headline. They were spying on us. Amazon, Walmart, use surveillance technology to bust unions. And by the way, they're spying on your social media accounts and they're blacklisting you. Once they fire you, you're in a blacklist you're not going to be hired again, ever, by Amazon, by Walmart, because they're sharing these names. So-and-so is a bad actor. He's organizing for a higher pay. Watch out. That is the enemy. During a Zoom call set up by union representatives and employees who had organized worker organizing committee, we noticed that managers of the company had busted into the meeting. They had crashed our Zoom call. Recalls Lorena Lopez, a director of organizing with Unite Here Local 11. Workers started to get very nervous and shut down their cameras so they would not be recognized. I was running the meeting and asked asked everyone to ID themselves, but the company people refused. During the meeting, a worker on the cleaning crew had volunteered to be the spokesperson for the group. According to Lopez, this worker was confronted by management the next day and pressured to quit. Wow. Here's another one from The Intercept. Leaked. New Amazon worker chat group or chat app to ban words like union, restrooms, pay raise, and plantation. Also grievance, slave labor, this is dumb, living wage, diversity, and uh, the V thing that we cannot even say here, and others. Is this America, by the way, or is this North Korea? Where we have slave labor, work when you're told, how you're told, and you get paid whatever we pay you. Shut up and be happy. And do your job, by the way. Or we're gonna make sure that you have no other alternative besides working as slave labor. We're gonna have goons, we're gonna have surveillance and spies, and AI to rat you out if you try to organize and ask for a better pay. What is this? Even Kim Jong-un is looking at this and saying, I better learn something from Amazon. And by the way, this is the same company that destroyed small business in this country. Unfairly, you have to say. And did not pay taxes at all. Amazon avoided more than $5 billion in corporate taxes. And they only pay 6%. That is the rate that they pay. 6%. I pay over 50. I'm not even a billionaire. I just happen to be living in the state of California. With the over taxation and crime all over the place. This is what we get for paying 50% taxes. Crumbling infrastructure. Crime all over the place, no services, you gotta wait months on the phone before somebody answers when you call any public utility company. Abuse of taxpayer money all over the place. They're spending over a hundred billion dollars to build the so-called Golden State train. They told us it's gonna cost 30 billion dollars. We're now racking up over a hundred billion dollars. They're spending over eight hundred thousand dollars to house a single homeless person. But anyways, that is California for you. But let's go back to Amazon and see how much they paid because in four years since 2018, the company paid an effective tax rate of five point one percent but i know if we tax the company a fair rate then we're gonna lose jobs the company's gonna be starving this is anti-capitalism bro what are you talking about if that is the case then how do you explain this because it appears that we have an excess of money at amazon they can afford to pay higher wages they can afford to pay their fair share in taxes 
and then some. Otherwise, how do you explain this? Jeff Bezos is scooping properties across the country. The latest, a massive property in the Hawaiian island of Maui, where he's secluded, by the way. Look at this. Private beach, private island for that matter. And no human being is allowed to be near Mr. Bezos. This is how they despise people. In their eyes, people are either workers, slave labor, or consumers. And that's all there is. Nobody else matters except the lizards in their own bubble. That's all what matters. These are the human beings who matter to the billionaires like Bezos. Jeffrey Bezos now has a massive portfolio that is worth Worth over 600 million dollars that includes 14 mansions meanwhile the American dream is dead if you want to buy a house good luck you want to rent good luck rents are through the roof and how did this company thrive the answer is the root of all evil the Federal Reserve think about it for a minute can you operate a small business and lose money year after year and still be in business the answer is no way, absolutely not. But for some reason, Amazon, a public company, reported negative profits. They've been losing money for years, but somehow their stock continues to go higher every single day. At least was going higher. And as the stock was riding higher, Amazon can use that equity value by taking out loans and expand even more and underpriced small businesses in this country. This is how they got to destroy small businesses, and they became Amazon, the monopoly. It's not because they're smart. This is what they teach you, the garbage, the filth, the propaganda that they teach you in colleges. Oh, Amazon is just smart. That's how they got to destroy small businesses in this country. Bullshit. They got to do it because the Fed has been manipulating asset prices higher, has been printing money out of thin air for years, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, as so-called accommodation, the stock market. So it didn't matter if Amazon was losing money. So long as they continue to expand and grow, money will land in Amazon stock. Every penny of pension funds, investment funds was chasing Amazon stock higher. And that was only enabled by the Fed's so-called accommodative policy. Otherwise, we would have scrutinized the fact that Amazon is not a profitable company. A money would have chased actual profitable companies instead. But because of the Fed policy, Amazon became what it is, and now it is a profitable company after destroying all the competition. So the rise of Amazon was only possible due to the Fed stabbing the poor and the middle class of this country right in the back for years by manipulating asset prices higher. Asset prices that happen to be majority owned by the 1% and corporate America. But now the tables are turning, at least for the moment, and the working class scored a massive victory against Amazon, the evil empire. Because for the first time in its 20 eight year history. Amazon will have a unionized facility here in the United States of America. How is that possible by the way? This is a massive facility in Staten Island which is now unionized and this was due to grassroots efforts by the same man who Amazon fired just two years ago, Christian Smalls. This is the payback. Two guys, two best friends, managed to bring down the oligarchy and the evil empire of Amazon down to their knees. They have no other choice now but to listen. They have no other choice right now but to crush their profit margins because they're going to have to pay labor more. This is not going to be the end, by the way. This is going to be contagious across the country. It started with companies like Deere, Kellogg's, Starbucks, and this fever is going to be spread across the country. The resentment of the working class against the oligarchs and the unfair practices that are going on in corporate America right now. Even the Amazon-owned Washington Post is admitting that the Amazon union win could usher a new wave of scrutiny of its labor practices. And the bottom line is, the contagious impact of this victory in Staten Island will force more and more wage inflation, which in turn, by the way, will cause more and more actual inflation. These are the rules of economics, which means that the Federal Reserve will have no other choice but to be even more aggressive to tackle this inflation down, which will result in a recession sooner or later. And a lot of these workers will lose their job, no doubt about it. But if we're gonna go down, we might as well go down swinging. And of course, after this massive victory, you have all of these vultures who want to claim credit for the win. Among them, AOC, who is an actress, by the way, she did not do shit for the working class. All talk, no action at all. And AOC was called out on Twitter, by the way, because she tweeted this, you know, the muscles emoji, after the unionization news came out on Amazon, and she immediately was called out by Crystal Ball, who said, here's the guy who organized the union 
drive talking about how you left them high and dry. These are your constituents, and you could not be bothered to show up until they're on the cusp of victory. Of course, AOC did not like any of that. She said security was an issue as well. 2021 included a lot of high-level threats on my life, which limited what activities I was able to do. Not the Met Gala, by the way, right? Especially those outside. Yeah, you know, the common folks, the working class, the undesirables, but not the elite at the gala and she continues on with more bullshit but clearly it really got under AOC's skin because she said the warehouse is not in my district and maybe you should look at a map before claiming so one scheduling conflict aside we have requested oversight investigations into Amazon met with Amazon workers in the Woodside warehouses and more hope you do more due diligence next time and here comes Kristen Smalls with the response saying SMH at AOC. That is terrible. Workers from your district definitely commute to Staten Island. I know them personally. Maybe you should do your own due diligence. Ooh. And Smalls had a lot more to say specifically to AOC. Take a listen. Now we get to go back and share a celebratory moment with them because without them this wouldn't be possible. And any message for uh, AOC specifically? Hell no. Man, I'm not giving her no. She don't she don't deserve this moment, yeah. Well, one more, last question. <laughs> uh, do you think it's possible today that Jeff Bezos is so outraged and upset that he might go to space permanently? I don't give a damn what Bezos did, to be you know, I was Bezos ain't the CEO anymore, but I know he was watching. And I'm happy he was able to enjoy this, uh, <laughs> if he is enjoying it, but whatever. Um, no permanent no permanent space mission? Nah, he probably, he probably ain't going nowhere, but it's no, you know what? It, once again, I ain't giving this moment to him either, you know. This is about the workers and, you know, Jeff Bezos, politicians, everybody else. Forget about it. I know who was here from day one. I know who supported us from day one. And I know what we're capable of doing. Today we proved that. Thanks, Chris. Here's the bottom line, folks. This is a major victory for the working class. Yes, it has ramifications. Yes, sooner or later, a recession will hit because inflation is getting out of control. A lot of these folks will lose their jobs. And yes, Amazon and many other warehouses will move faster toward using robots instead of human beings. We all know that. But if we're gonna go down, we might as well go down swinging. And this was a major victory, a major threat to the oligarchy and the dominance of corporate America against the working man and woman. But the tables are turning. And this is just the beginning, folks. This will cause more wage inflation whether they like it or not and it's a victory we must celebrate because it is the first time that david wins against goliath in corporate america we don't see these stories all the time but this victory alone shows that the tide is turning and workers are saying enough is enough either you pay us a fair wage to combat this inflation either you treat us with respect or goodbye better yet we're gonna fight you and defeat you over it. This is a warning sign for all corporations in America that things are changing and you better get in with the program. Do not take your workers for granted. You don't own them and you're gonna find that out the hard way and this is just the beginning. Anyhow folks, we're gonna move on here and cover the market information for you. We start with the closing of the indices today and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 103.61 points or a gain of 0.30%. And here is the leader of the day, the Nasdaq, closing in the green by 271.05 points or a gain of 1.90%. The S&P 500 also in the green by 36.78 points or a gain of 0.81%. And here are the sector's performances today, leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, consumer cyclicals, and at number two for the silver, communication services, number three for the bronze, technology. And the laggards of the day led by utilities, REITs, and healthcare. So the winners last week are the losers today. Meanwhile, the losers of last week are the winners, at least today. These kind of rotational back and forth moves in the stock market are not a good sign, specifically heading into the earnings season. And boy, we're having a lot of traps being set here, one step at a time. We'll talk 
in the charts analysis. But here is the advance to decline ratios in YSE 50% advancing versus 46% declining. The NASDAQ 61% advancing versus 36% declining. And of course, we have more 52 week lows versus 52 week highs in the NASDAQ. So the rally once again, courtesy of the big caps, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, Nvidia, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, which is telling, by the way, of two things. Number one, fund flows. Number two, retail participation. Retail participation is powerful. It will push indices higher. The problem is, are they doing the right or the wrong thing? Well, earnings season is going to expose all of that. And oh, by the way, we have a Fed meeting in May. Watch out here. Moving on to commodities. A big rebound for crude. The WTI closing the day with gains of over four and a quarter percent. Brent closing the day with gains of over three and a quarter percent likewise gasoline was up almost two percent heating oil closing the day with gains of a little over four percent while natural gas closing in the green be it modestly gains of a little over half a percentage point and the reason behind the rebound in oil was the fact that saudi arabia is actually hiking prices into record territory this is a smack in the face the Biden administration just like will smith boom right in the face you're gonna release spr we're gonna increase prices let's see who wins at the end of the day and i think the winner will be opic they have control over the supply so this is a losing fight by the Biden administration likewise when we talk about softs green across the board the gains were led by oj the winner so far we also had gains for sugar and coffee let's talk about coffee for a little while because i got into coffee just a few days ago and the reason is when we look at the daily chart we have a double bottom formation that could take us all the way to the next resistance at around 236 if that level is broken then we could see higher highs we can see more gains to come because when we look at a monthly chart and we talked about this in details in a prior video a few months ago that coffee tends to trade in cycles and we usually see massive gains and then massive drops coffee has been in a downward trend since 2011 and this downward trend is reversing matter of fact it reversed long time ago now we're seeing the acceleration to the upside which could produce gains that can exceed imaginations we could see coffee over 300 350 even 400 who knows where the end of this pop will be all we know that the tailwinds are intact for coffee fertilizer prices are moving higher and the farmers are saying be it in brazil be it in uh, costa rica be it in honduras they're saying fertilizer prices are surging out of whack. We're going to have to increase costs for the coffee we're selling. What does that mean? Coffee prices will move higher. And so long as the consumer continues to pay, there is no end in sight for the rise in coffee prices. We'll see how it reacts at around 236 and then take it from there. But back to softs, lumber also closing in the green, be it modestly. On the other hand, we have declines led by cocoa, losing almost one and a quarter percent, a little more than that. And then we have cotton closing pretty much in the flat line metals a modest gain for gold not so hot so for silver likewise platinum pretty much flat palladium with modest gains a little over half a percentage point but look at copper once again the outlier moving higher and closing the day with gains of almost two percent what about meats lean hogs no longer the new big tech Matter of fact, they're getting slaughtered. Lean hogs closed the day down by over three and a quarter percent today. Why would you need lean hogs when you have the actual big tech moving higher? Likewise, feeder cattle was down a little over two percent today, while live cattle futures were down a little over half a percentage point. Not a good day for meats. When it comes to grains, this is the new session started as I'm recording this video, but here's how the futures closed today. Oats was down along with rough rice, modest losses here, but we have gains across across the board led by wheat wheat closing the day with gains of almost three percent so again no stop in sight for grains likewise soybeans soybean oil soybean meal even corn all closing in the green today when we talk about corn we know there is going to be a shortage a massive one because the farmers are using soybeans instead of corn due to the shortages and the impulsive price rise in fertilizers but here's who's hoarding right now china china's hoarding corn supplies from the united states why is china hoarding food by the way a better question is why are we allowing china to hoard our corn when we are anticipating shortages where is the thinking here where are the priorities in the meantime china is taking advantage of our stupidity why not by the way i would do the same if i was xi jinping
Anyways, moving on to options, the big casino, the hottest table by far was Apple. At around 1 million contracts, about 61% of those were calls. And at number one, the hottest table in my opinion, because it might have not won the volume for today, but the majority of the action was at the Twitter table, which by the way, traded around 1 million contracts today, about 71% of those were calls. At number three, Tesla, the souffle, at around 750,000 contracts traded for the name today, about 61.5% of those were calls. When we talk about Twitter, by the way, we saw an attempt of a gamma squeeze today. The gains are absolutely insane. Look, for example, at the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date of this Friday. It gained over 10,000% today alone. Now, of course, we have traders who chase the move after the fact, and they traded in and out of the 50 bucks calls, the 55 calls, the 60 calls. They were just choosing whatever gains left in the move because unless you bought Twitter calls on Friday, you did not score 10,000% gains. You might have scored 20, 30, 80% in a day trading in and out of the 50 bucks calls, but that's about it. That tells me, by the way, that the move in Twitter will fall apart, not erasing all of the gains entirely, but maybe in the next few days we will see a pullback in Twitter. The question remains, are we peaking in the squeeze higher? That depends on the implied volatility. It's already getting in the 90s, so maybe a pullback and then a resumption of the buying after we see things cooling down a little and perhaps the premiums becoming a little more attractive. They're too expensive right now, specifically for calls. We'll talk more about Twitter and the heat map analysis, but before we do that, here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker, you guessed it, TWTR Twitter. A lot of trades today. Absolute insanity. I'm just going to read one of them. We're talking about billions of dollars, folks. A lot of money being poured betting on higher prices for Twitter. In this case, they bought the 55 calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, April 8th, with the expectations that Twitter could move higher by more than 10% by then. They paid around 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $7 million. What about the ticker FSR, Fisker Motors? A loser for the year, but a recent gainer in this uh, rebound ratty, with a lot of stupidity, by the way. But again, a lot of names to be fair were way oversold so they managed to rebound higher somebody is calling a top for this rebound specifically in these speculative names including fisker because they bought puts the 12 and a half puts for the expiration date june 17th with the expectations that fisker fsr would drop down by more than 14 percent by then they paid around one buck and 45 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two and a half million dollars and here it is apes are you paying attention or not because somebody is buying puts on AMC, in this case the 22 puts for the expiration date May 20th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than half five and a half percent, excuse me, by then, and they paid around three bucks and seventy-five cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around three point three million dollars. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker EVBG for Everbridge? A loser year to date, but a recent gainer, specifically today. Somebody's betting that the gains are over. They're fading the rip by buying the 45 puts for the expiration date, May 20th. With expectations, the name could pull back by more than 6.5% by then. They paid around 4 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $2.5 million. What about the ticker BRCC? This is for Black Rifle Coffee, a good company, but a lousy stock. It became sort of a meme stock and it pumped significantly higher today. Now, I did follow this trade and I bought puts on BRCC. Not because I don't like the company, but when you give me that kind of stupidity on a silver plate, just like the apes did with the AMC, I gotta buy puts. I gotta eat steak and lobster. This is the beauty of this stupidity. And so far, these puts are scoring at least after hours. In this case, they bought the 25 puts with the expiration date this Friday, April 8th, with expectations. The name could pull back by more than 12% by then. They paid around one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one million dollars. What about the ticker MRO? This is for Marathon Petroleum. They're buying calls here, perhaps the revival of the energy trade. It took a break in the last few weeks as technology started to rebound, technology and growth. But are we about to go back to the inflationary trade of energy and materials as we get closer 
to the earnings season, and all of those dip buyers and rebounders start to get nervous about technology and the prospects of peak earnings, and the hawkish Fed will see. Maybe a little too early right now, but somebody sees that outlook in the horizon, because their buying calls an MRO, in this case the 28 calls, for the expiration date May 20th. With expectations, the marathon could move higher by more than 9% by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around half a million dollars. And lastly, what about the ticker TSLA Tesla? We know who folded, by the way. It happens to be the FOMO crowd waiting in the sidelines. They got the delivery news over the weekend, and today they got the Elon Musk news of buying Twitter. And that in turn excited the Kelties waiting in the sidelines, and they bought Tesla stock today. Not a lot of call options buying, by the way, meaning it was not really a gamma squeeze. It was more of buying the stock organically. And somebody's betting for more gains to come for TSLA. SLA by buying calls this time around. Not a long-term one, but they're betting on another squeeze higher. In this case, they bought the 1,230 calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, April 8th, with the expectations that Tesla could add another 7% or so gains before Friday. They paid around 6 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $3 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, all in all muted we're seeing more losses in financials, healthcare, industrials, defensives. The winners last week, REITs and utilities, also suffering today. But the majority of the action was in the north western side of the map, which happens to be the retail crowd favorite side of the map. We're talking about technology, the big caps. We're talking about software, chips, the Chinese names, the social media names, Snapchat, Twitter specifically. Twitter was up over 20% today. Why? Because we got the news that Elon Musk took a 9.2% stake in Twitter. Obviously, he did the poll a few days ago. Do you think Twitter is violating the First Amendment and whatever censorship? And the majority already said yes. We know that Twitter is censoring voices out there. We know censorship is rampant, not just in Twitter, but also YouTube and Facebook. But here's my problem with Elon Musk, Reverend Elon Musk, by the way, just for the culties, you know, they might take that as a sign of disrespect. Anyways, I don't buy it. I don't think Elon Musk is the hero. That he's just buying Twitter to save us from censorship. Don't get me wrong, the man is a master manipulator. And this is for certain a win in the public's eye because he's seen as a savior, as a guy who's using his wealth to counter the censorship, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, if Elon Musk really wanted to combat censorship and the big tech oligarchy, he could have just started a new social media platform like Twitter, like Facebook, like YouTube, and went head to head against the big tech oligarchs. But he did not do any of that. That tells me that this is all about his ego, his fragile ego. The SEC enforced an agreement and he sees it as gagging his voice on Twitter. And he's now saying, you know what? Look at me. I'm so rich, I can buy the entire company. How dare anybody even thinks about ganging me? I can own the entire company. This is all about Elon Musk's ego, folks. It's all about his voice. It's not about us. He's not saving us. He could if he wanted to, but again, he's a compromised tool. He's in the pockets of the deep state, just in case you didn't know. And if the deep state at some point orders Elon Musk to gag any of us, he would do so, no questions at all. If the deep state says, share some Tesla information, driver's information with us, he will do so with no hesitation at all. Because at the end of the day, he's an asset for the deep state. You don't get that rich, by the way, without the blessing of the deep state. So I don't buy any of this bullshit that Elon Musk is the savior and he's buying Twitter to make it more democratized, yada, yada, yada. But from a financial perspective, is this good for Twitter or bad? I think it is good because it was a dying company. No excitement at all. And here comes Elon Musk adding some flavor. Perhaps he will tweak a thing or two, maybe make the platform a little more exciting or adding more revenue sources for the company. So far, Dorsey and company failed to monetize this company, Twitter. And Dorsey is not even CEO anymore. So I see it as good for the company. Do you buy the stock now? I say wait for a pullback. Let's assess the fundamentals. When the next earnings report comes out, there's going to be another dip. And if the report comes out promising, and we hear more about Musk's plans to monetize Twitter, there is going to be plenty of meat in the bone to chew on at that point. But rushing right now, not my kind of move. Anyhow, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. The notable mover, in my opinion, is the XBI, the biotech ETF. Impressive move so far, by the way. 
In a month, the XBI is up almost 15%. The bad news is, year to date, the XBI is down 15%. And we're seeing this story, by the way, in chips, in technology, all the recent rebounders, all what they're doing right now is folks waiting on the sidelines, be it retail or institutionals alike, saying, you know what, the sell-off was a little too steep for technology, for biotech, for chips, for software, and now we're heading into earnings season. At least, let's play a rebound until we get to judgment day, which is earnings season, and then hop off the ship again and lighten up. Because earnings season is not going to be that pleasant, by the way. It's going to be hunting season for the recent rebounders. We'll talk more in the charts analysis, but today we saw chips moving higher, XLK technology also moving higher, the cyclicals, the XLY, XRT also moving higher, the reopening names were moving higher, but also the weighting of Tesla is really important to the XLY, but besides that, energy was muted, XOP, XLE, OIH not doing anything at all, materials were flat, staples were flat, no excitement at all, unless you were in biotech, XBI. When it comes to growth versus value, so far the ad performance of growth continues to go on versus value. But year to date, value is still at performing growth. This earnings season will be extremely important, either to reaffirm the fact that growth is deserving of the ad performance, the recent ad performance that is, or earnings season will expose the recent rebound and the weakness in growth, and we will see a migration back into value. When it comes to commodities, gold moved higher, the GLD, not the GDX, gold miners were actually down today. Uranium was down, the oil ETFs were flattish, but TAN, the ticker TAN for solar, was trading higher today, so you have biotech and solar as the ad performers today. When it comes to international markets, it is one of those days where you have the Qs, the NASDAQ ad performing, and that usually comes hand in hand with an ad performance in Chinese equities. The retail crowd loves Chinese equities, and they continue to buy the dip, and therefore we have the FXY, the MCHY, all leading the gains in international markets today. But look at emerging markets, for example. We saw a lot of call options buying in the EEM during last week, so are we about to see the revival of the emerging market trade? Well, that depends on the dollar. If the dollar goes down, starts to ease, then you buy EEM with both hands. But right now, if the dollar continues to move higher, all of these rebounds will be faded right away. Moving on to charts, and we start with SPY. 30 minutes chart. Anything new here? They thought they were clever, by the way, last week, by building that little bear trap, which your uncle, the Maverick of Wall Street, did not fall for and warned you not to fall for. Because if you're gonna fool us, by the way, make it a little believable. For example, had they closed the week, for example, below 450 on Friday, I would have said, okay, this is a shorting signal, perhaps all the way down to, let's say, 443. But they did not do that. And hence, it was too obvious that they're building a bear trap. And by the way, they're also building bull traps. You don't realize it yet because the equities market is going higher, but you realize that as we get closer to earnings season, and you certainly going to know that after earnings season, the disaster of the upcoming earnings season, which could be the nail in the coffin of this bull market. In my opinion, the higher they go, the more delicious the shorting opportunities will be. It's going to turn from earnings season to hunting season. But for now, did the action that we got in the SPY change anything at all? Not really. The formation remains bullish, and the reason is the chart did not lose the most important key numbers support. And I warned the bears over and over and over again. You don't have the green light to start shorting right now until some of the key support lines start to get broken. So far, none of that happened. The chart certainly lost some support. None of that support is key. When we talk about key, we're talking about 450, we're talking about 443, and then all the way to 430. None of these support lines were broken at all. They weren't even touched. So for now, the resistance remains at 459. The support at 4.54. And by the way, what happened to the psychology battle today? We're seeing more of the FOMO crowd waiting on the sidelines saying they're not going to give us a better price. So let's hop in and buy the indices right now. I believe that this could be a trap if this happens. Let's say the run that we got today will form a lower high and that in turn will lead to a lower low. Then we have a reversal pattern, which will be confirmed by the way by breaking either 4.46 or 4. 
43 is support. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. Any damage done? Not really. The chart recaptured 4,549 and a half. And now the bulls are eyeing one scenario, which is what if this is an ABC pattern? We got an A leg, we got the B, and now we're forming the C all the way to all time highs. There is a lot of talk right now about all time highs. It is a fantasy. If it happens, it would be a gift on a silver platter for the bears to start shorting. But this is what the bulls are betting on. The volume went down today, which is an encouraging signal for the bulls. Likewise, the momentum indicator, it is stalling when we talk about the RSI and also the MACD indicator, both are stalling. They're going to start to curve their way down. And the bears are betting that either we're going to see a lower high, which will take us down to lose 4,549 and a half, and then eventually losing 4,472 of support. The bears are also betting on the double top scenario. What if this run takes us all the way back to the previous top and then we pull back again? We see losses all the way down to 4,384.5. You're not going to know that until we get back all the way to the previous top. So the bears must wait before they start shorting. The bulls need to start thinking about booking profits because being seduced by this move ahead of earnings is a risky proposition. On top of that, you have two scenarios now, a lower high and a double top that could work against you and we see the last batch of bulls being trapped. What about the SPX, the cash index? We have a rebound, still maintaining a range above the 200 days moving average, which is bullish by the way. You're not going to start to get bearish in this chart until the 200 days moving average is broken once again from support back into resistance. But the chart did not make it above 4,590. And I believe that this number will be sticky for the SPX to pass above once again. Will we have a rejection from 4,590? This is what I'm waiting for. That would form the lower high and we'll be waiting for the lower low that would be a reversal pattern and then the ultimate confirmation will be closing below the 200 days moving average moving on to the cues an hourly chart for the nasdaq anything new that happened today nothing really because it would have been a legitimate bear trap had they closed below 360 on Friday. That did not happen, and therefore, it was too easy to spot. Unless you are a dumb bear, you did not get trapped in this one. Will the bulls be trapped by this run higher? It depends on the same scenario that we discussed in the SPY. Is this a formation for lower high, and then a lower low, and eventually the chart loses 360 as support? That is too early to say, so we're not going to bet on that right now. We will wait till the chart gives us the shorting signal. For now, we don't have any any at all. If you want to chase the rally, do it via individual names, specifically names with a lot of appeal in the options market. When you see a lot of call options buying a certain name and the implied volatility is not too hot for now, you can chase these names and squeeze a little more gains. And this is what I've been doing, by the way, buying call options in individual names. But I'm not chasing the indices higher. I'm not chasing RKK higher, for example. I'm not committing anything besides short-term call options in chasing this rebound higher. For now, the resistance remains 372, the support at around 365 and a half. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs. The chart managed to recapture 15,000 of support. The volume went down slightly. All of these are points in the bullish camp. On the other hand, the momentum indicators are stalling. They're about to reverse. It's just a matter of time. That is a point in the bears camp. But the bulls are bidding on an ABC pattern, which will take us all the way to at least 15,975. The bears will counter and say not too fast because what if this is a lower high and we lose 15,000 sooner or later? Or better yet, what if this a double top formation in the making, which will stop at around 15,260 once again, and we have a solid, reliable shorting signal if that plays out and we see the chart losing 15,000 of support after a double top formation. That would be a solid reversal signal. But we're not there yet. So the bulls remain in charge. The bears have to wait for more signals. Here is the IWM, the Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart. It doesn't look as good as the SPY and the Qs. Yes, it was a positive day, but the IWM failed to make it above 208. The good news is it keeps 204 and a half is support but the problem is what if this is a bear flag formation and sooner or later we will see the iwm down at 204 and a half once again the problem for the bears even if that happens you're not going to short 
unless we have a daily closing below 204 and a half. And I would even argue below 203 to have a confirmation. What about the dollar index? Dixie continues to move higher. This is a bullish consolidation, not a bearish one, because you have the momentum indicators in negative divergence. In regular charting behavior, we see flush downs when that happens, as the chart starts to lose momentum. But if the loss in momentum is just resulting in consolidation, is this bullish or bearish behavior? In my opinion, it is bullish because even with the negative momentum, no damage is being done for the chart. It is not moving down. It is holding ground. This is a chart that wants to pop higher, and it has all the tailwinds to continue to move higher. And of course, gold is not liking any of that because if the dollar moves higher it's going to be really difficult for gold to initiate a rally so gold is waiting and waiting and waiting at the same support of around 1925 waiting for either the dixie to pull back or for the 10-year yield to pull back in a significant fashion now the question that i got today is gold miners were down but gold futures were up is that a leading indicator that gold futures are about to go down to I don't read it that way. I see these gold miners getting overextended in the technicals. We talked about that in yesterday's video, not just in the daily, but the weekly charts. And we're seeing a pullback. But once gold futures start to move higher dramatically, we will see the dip being bought in gold miners again. This is the year of gold after all. The tailwinds are all here. And just a reminder, I was a bear on gold until December of last year, so I did not become a gold bull until recently because the macro and the fundamentals changed, and that supports higher prices for gold. Moving on to oil, uh oh, what's going on here? It appears that oil is moving its way higher in a saucer bottoming formation. It recaptured 105.84. This is a four hours chart, by the way. The next stop is retesting the sloping line of resistance. If that is broken, we will see oil back at 118 once again. What a massive defeat for the Biden administration and the stupid and the ill-timed release of the SPR. Here's the daily chart for the 10-year yield. Is this all there is in the pullback of the 10-year yield? I don't believe so. I might end up being wrong, but what if this is a bear flag formation? And sooner or later, the 10-year yield will break below 2.34 and perhaps pull back all the way down to 2.2, if not 2%. Equal. If that is the case, then the TLT is going higher. Here is a weekly chart for the TLT. So far, not so hard, so at least today, but the week is still young. If we have a pullback in the 10 year yield breaking the stiff support at around 2.34, then we will see the TLT blasting higher, all the way to 134.5, and, and then we'll take it from there. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. The VIX could not make it above 20 yet again. This is a massive victory for the bulls, crushing the VIX perhaps all the way down to 15. Look at the MACD indicator. It is losing the positive momentum as if the VIX is giving up, saying, hey, you know what? No hedgers here. Nobody wants to hedge, so I'm going down. If it goes down, we have 15. 15 as the last support and folks if the vix gets down to 15 i will be buying puts with both hands we're talking all in because it would be a gift on a silver platter relax that we have not seen in a long long time remember earnings season will be hunting season what about the vxn four hours chart we now have a confirmation of the rejection at around 27 and a half which could take the vxn all the way down to 21 if that is the case then the queues will manage to make higher highs so watch out for that the vxn is losing some of the recent positive momentum as if it's giving up but remember the bearish momentum for the vxn is already bottoming how low is it gonna go all what the vxn is need is a little spark a little little flare up on the Russia Ukraine front more hawkish talk by the Fed something that will catch the market by surprise and then we will see the VXN shooting a lot higher in a massive impulsive rally higher because for now we have a lot of complacency and every time we have complacency in the VIX traders and market participants get caught with their pants down and then they scramble the stampede to start to hedge when it's already too late you want to start to hedge when the volatility indices are down specifically when you look at futures the futures of the VIX a lot higher, indicating that the VIX will rebound and trade higher again. So why not take the opportunity right now when puts are cheap, look at your portfolio, which names ran too high too fast, which names are under threat of the upcoming earnings season, and you start to buy puts as a hedge insurance while it's still cheap moving on to apple this is a daily chart friday's candle was a rebound at around 172.4 today we're getting the follow-up of the rebound not quite the previous highs yet but close enough 
This is yet another indicator that we're seeing a lot of institutionals, but also retail, buying these ETFs, the Qs, the XLK, that pushes Apple higher. Is there more juice to squeeze in Apple to move higher, perhaps all the way to 182.6, which is the 3 trillion mark? Yes, there is. And that could happen easily. But if it happens, it would be a decent signal to start shorting Apple because the odds say it's going to top there. Why? Because the momentum indicators are topping. There's not a lot of gas left in the tank of Apple. There is enough to get us to 182.6, maybe 183 or 185. But if we get there, you can bet that Apple ran out of gas and we will see a pullback. The higher it goes, the steeper the pullback. And here it is, Tesla, an hourly chart. We know who folded, obviously the folks waiting on the sidelines, the FOMO crowd, who today decided that it is time to buy because they did not get a better opportunity for a few days after the split pump that took us all the way to 1,090 and a half. The FOMO crowd looked at that and said, you know what, Elon buying Twitter, the delivery numbers over the weekend, we will not get a better price than this. Let's hop in and buy Tesla right now. The problem is earnings are coming. And the higher it goes, the steeper the pullback when earnings finally hit. And therefore, for guys like me, I'm looking at all of this and I'm rubbing my hands. I'm making a list already. Which names I'm going to start to short heading into earnings? Because you're giving us a gift. We have peak earnings. Earnings this season are not going to be better than last year. You really think these stocks are going to trade at higher prices than last year based on solid fundamentals? Not going to happen. It's going to happen on stampedes, on gamma squeezes, on things that are unreliable and they can fade out quickly. Moving on. Bitcoin, what's going on here? We have to assume that the move right now is a bull flag consolidation because this is what the technicals say. Whether you agree or not on the fundamentals and the psychology, the technicals say this is a bull flag consolidation. Sooner or later, the chart will move higher. You're not going to become bearish on BTC and start shorting until 42,000 is broken as support. And what about AMC? AMC, it appears that the negative momentum is bottoming, which means we could see AMC moving higher. Now, we're seeing a lot of put options buying. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe Johnny come lately's who missed out on the real shorting opportunity when the stock was trading above 30. But for now, what we're seeing on the hourly perspective, at least, is a chart that already experienced a lot of selling. And now it's holding ground. It is forming a bottom. If the buyers show up, this chart could move higher easily to above 26 once again. Am I buying calls? Not really. Not right now. I thought about it, but I'm seeing better opportunities and other names. So I'll leave that one alone, but for the apes who are listening, it appears, at least for now, that the negative momentum is bottoming, which is opening an opportunity for you to start buying the stock and buying calls and push it a little higher. But if you don't do that, the more sellers will arrive. We will see AMC moving down again, breaking a very important support at around 21. And that would be an ugly defeat for the apes. I wanted to cover more charts, but we're running out of time, unfortunately. So we're going to have to do that in tomorrow's video. But for now, I'm moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the most important event is the services PMI and the ISM services index. What is behind the importance of services? We talked about it before. If we have more inflation and more activities in the services sector of the economy, then we have healthy inflation and the Fed has the cushion needed to start tightening aggressively. But if we see services also stagnating or even getting into stagflation where the pace of economic activities in services are moving down, on the other hand, prices are staying higher, that would be an alarming signal, folks. And we'll talk about that when we get the numbers. But we also have some Fed zombies speaking from San Francisco, Mary Daly from New York, John Williams. But most importantly, the vice chair, Governor Braindead, is speaking on what? On inflation inequality. How dare you? You are the creator of inflation inequality. This is like inviting Ted Bundy to speak on women's rights. Anyhow, folks, we're going to wrap it up here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.